Hello everyone, I'm, I'm going to take us through the gallery walk that we completed on Thursday. And the gallery walk was designed so you can review some of the big concepts of Unit 2 and to also see the um, real world applications that we can make with some of the economic tools that we developed. Um, and we can use these tools to think about social problems and hopefully help solve social problems as well. And so um, the first uh, graphical model that we have here is um, a simple supply and demand model for a rental market and we're intervening by uh, putting a binding price ceiling. So this is rent control. Uh, the social problem associated with this is predictably the affordable housing crisis. Next to each gallery walk station, I kind of had like this interesting picture that was designed to provoke your thinking and to see how these um, graphs can relate to reality. And so just very simply, we can see um, you're going to need to know the social welfare implications of a binding price ceiling. And one typical binding price ceiling is rent control policies. Uh, we can see that uh, consumer surplus um, uh, in equilibrium, if we didn't intervene in this market, um, seems to or could be um, smaller than uh, the newfound consumer surplus with the binding price ceiling. For sure, there is going to be people that um, acquire this uh, or rental units um, that are going to see their social welfare increase at the expense of producer surplus. We also have to think of the trade-offs associated with this. So we get dead weight loss, and then we get a gap between quantity supplied and quantity demanded. Um, I'm not going to go into the nuances of explaining these concepts over and over again, but I'm gonna include uh, links in the description of this YouTube video um, that goes over consumer and producer surplus and uh, dead weight loss, uh, short of, sort of how you would, you would arrive at this uh, model, or in more in depth about this model. Then in station two, it was also again about the affordable housing crisis. Um, I wanted you to think about in your handout I gave you, um, what are so, some solutions if um, you know, a binding price ceiling in, the, in terms of rent control is problematic and leads to some trade-offs, what other solutions can we kind of come up with? And so I invited you to think about what sort of policies could actually shift the supply curve to the right, and with the rightward shift of the supply curve uh, in the rental market, uh, we would expect rents to fall. And so we had talked about all sorts of government regulations in big cities um, that prevent um, you know, people from building up and sort of um, the political stories and background behind that. So some of you wanted to remove those sort of government regulations to shift the supply curve to the right and um, drop uh, the rental prices uh, for people. Um, then at station three, um, I kind of had this um, in the gallery walk, the civil rights gallery walk that you did last week, um, this wonderful image of civil rights protesters marching in Washington, D.C., um, and we could see also they're calling for a higher minimum wage in the picture as well. So the minimum wage debate is obviously a very on, a contentious and ongoing debate in American politics today. Um, we've developed this model, simple supply and demand model, but we have a key assumption to it, which I'll talk more about next week. Uh, that, it's a, that we're assuming a perfectly competitive labor market. We're gonna complicate um, our analysis further when we introduce what is called the monopsony model in unit five, um, where in that particular labor market, you wouldn't necessarily get some of the same trade-offs that we're going to see momentarily. So assuming perfectly competitive labor markets um, and the demand curve in this market is going to be the business, the, the supply curve is going to be the workers, you are going to get dead weight loss you know, a loss in social surplus resulting from intervening in this market. And the way that we think about the minimum wage is a binding price floor. So remember the economics cheer, uh, the floors up high and the ceilings down low. Uh, price floors are binding if they're above equilibrium, price ceilings are binding if they're below equilibrium. And so we can see that in this case, uh, producer surplus for those workers that are able to find a job increases. We don't know whether total producer surplus increases. It depends on the area of this uh, triangle right here. Um, but we also see there are other implications, right? At this binding price floor, we disrupt equilibrium, and now there is a gap between the quantity demanded in this market of workers and the quantity supplied, right? So now there's going to be more people willing to work in this low-skilled labor market um, because um, we've obviously set a, a price floor and those people's opportunity costs of like um, not picking up another job or 
a minimum wage job increases. There are going to be more people that are going to enter this market. However, uh, businesses are going to demand less of this labor, and they might actually turn to substitutes like capital or machines. And this is the story we tell us, right? This, in this simple model, the price floor, minimum wage, leads to uh, greater unemployment. Now, we'll complicate this later uh, with the monopsony model in Unit 5, um, where we'll see where we can actually install minimum wage and increase employment. So that would be later. Then we turn to Station 4. Station 4, I told you, and I apologize to you guys. I said that I think I was a little bit too angry in the morning when I was making Station 4. Um, I said this was probably the hardest station for you guys to understand. And so I don't want us to you know, spend a lot of time here trying to understand it. All I want us to think about is um, tax incidents and who actually bears the burden of a tax. And so here we have labor markets where this time rich people, um, the supply curves are workers as well, and then we demand our businesses. And then I put perfectly elastic demand and perfectly inelastic demand. Again, remember the chair, elastic's like this, elastic, or inelastic is like this, elastic is like this. So elastic means, in this case, I would want, um, as, as somebody that sells my labor, I would want um, the people that purchase my labor to have inelastic demand for my labor, right? Because that would mean that I'm very valuable. And if there is inelastic demand for my labor, any attempt to tax me, um, the business that employs me would actually try to pay the tax by raising my salary. And so what this idea tries to get at is that depending on how much we think rich people are actually valuable in society, if we try to tax them, um, they essentially, they may not actually bear the burden of the tax or tax incidents themselves. If the demand curve for uh, rich people is, uh, the labor market demand curve for rich people is more inelastic than elastic, they would actually uh, bear uh, no burden in a perfectly inelastic world. Of course, these are extremes. This is a bit difficult to understand, but I think I have a YouTube video that I'll link in the description to help you if you really want to know. But this was a very hard problem to so. solve. This one was a little bit easier. Um, and then station five and six dealt with war and conflict and the relationship between economics and war and conflict. When we get into game theory, we're actually going to expand our analysis as well, um, or use economic tools to think about war as well um, more frequently. But uh, this was a picture taken in the 1990s by Sebastião Salgado. Um, it's a really cool picture. Um, it talks about how in 1991, Iraq evaded Kuwait, and then after they were expelled from Kuwait, the retreating Iraqi armies burned the oil fields, and this dramatically increased the price of oil. So I invited you to think about how this would do this, and it would just be a simple leftward shift of the supply curve. Um, and then, of course, we would expect price to go up um, and the quantity demanded in that market to fall. Um, over here, we see in station six, um, I invited you, it's a simple trade model uh, with consumer and producer surplus. Um, chain it in, which you had to write on your sheet of paper, and then we see the gap between quantity supplied and quantity demanded. This time the gap is not necessarily, or is not going to lead to dead weight loss because you can import the gap. Uh, and Station 6 invited you to think about um, the current conflict in Ukraine, specifically Russia threatening to turn off the gas. Why would this be potentially um, devastating um, for Europe? And Station 7, 8, and 9, before we conclude, 789 dealt with the opioid epidemic, we worked with the opioid epidemic a lot to understand elasticities of demand and supply curves, um, and a lot of different, con or, uh, a lot of different uh, economic concepts. Station 7, I in particular asked you, uh, with the picture of Zendaya, to think about just to draw a simple supply and demand curve and then shading consumer and producer surplus for the market for opioids. And I invited you to think about how um, our, how we thought about welfare in society as in terms of consumer and producer surplus in economics and why that might be problematic. And so some of you pointed out that, um, you know, consumer and producer surplus in a drug market, you know, doesn't get at kind of like the fact that it is a drug market, right? And the people that are consuming it may not actually be um, living up to their full potential and stuff like that. So we're getting at this idea that there are limitations to these um, measures of social welfare in our society. And at station eight, um, I invited you to think about um, you know, why supply-side solutions to the opioid epidemic might not be um, get the biggest bang for your buck. And so here I drew a perfectly inelastic demand curve. Again, this is a, a case in economics of where we study extremes to understand the range of possibilities that exist between extremes. 
And this inelastic, perfectly inelastic demand curve, of course, I don't think anything is perfectly inelastic. There are things that are very close, like insulin. But we can see that a leftward shift of the supply curve with this perfectly inelastic demand curve, uh, quantity in the market wouldn't change. Right? So if we're trying to address the opioid epidemic with supply-side solutions, we would expect, you know, obviously the curve is not perfectly inelastic. Um, we would expect quantity uh, to fall, um, but it wouldn't by fall, fall by much. Like equilibrium quantity to fall, but not, not by, by much for more elastic markets. And then here at station nine, I invited you to shift the supply and demand curves and to come up with policies to solve the opioid epidemic. And then I want to just conclude, like this cheer really can help you. We've been practicing it over several days. Supply, demand, inelastic, elastic, floors up high, ceilings down low, substitutes, the price of uh, good X goes up, uh, the demand for good Y goes up, complements as the price of good X goes up, the demand for good Y falls. This really can help you on your test uh, next week. We are done with this video. I'm gonna put links explaining each station. So there'll be nine videos, hopefully, around nine, maybe less, in the description of this YouTube video, and I'll be so patient. Okay, we're done.